The Yamaha DX7, an instrument so technically and musically advanced that it has no peer. A keyboard so versatile and responsive to both your mind and your hands that it becomes the standard by which other moderately small synthesizers will be judged. The DX7 from Yamaha, a synthesizer that at last dares to challenge acoustic instruments. A digital programmable algorithm synthesizer using sophisticated FM technology to create voices that are lifelike, warm, realistic, and rewarding to play. Together now, we shall explore this synthesizer from another dimension. Welcome to the future, the DX7 from Yamaha. At any given moment, you can be doing one of three things with the DX. Preparing to play the synthesizer by programming and storing sounds into internal or external cartridge memory locations. Adding specialized performance function characteristics to the keyboard and controllers. And having made these preparations, playing the instrument itself. In order to enter the playing zone, you first set the DX up and connect it to either a high quality set of headphones or proper amplification and speaker system. Having placed the synthesizer on a sturdy stand and assuming that you are going to use an external sound system, you must patch from the output jack which is located at the left side of the back of the DX to the input of your system. Next, connect the volume pedal, modulation pedal, sustained foot switch and portamental foot switch to the clearly labeled jacks that are also on the back of the DX adjacent to the output jack. Attach the breath controller into the jack located at the left front of the case, and at this time plug in the DX's AC power cord. Turn the synthesizer on with the power switch that is located right rear of the power and you are ready to start. Turn off the tape for a moment, and I'll wait for you to do all this. Now that you are set up, look with the face of the DX. Themselves, only four controls are capable of motion. These are the overall volume output slider, the data entry slider, a pitch bending wheel, and a modulation wheel. The other 42 switches that you will touch are flat membrane covered switches that are color coded for simplicity and operation. Note carefully that controls that are used for playing the DX are green. Controls for setting the characteristics of the keyboard or controllers and other utilitarian tasks, including global memory transfers, initialization of memory for programming or recalling a non-stored edit, as well as a number of other functions, are color-coded brown. The third color that is used is violet, and these controls deal with creating or editing the voices that are to be played. A single red switch is used for storing completed voice data, at the center of the array of switches, you will note a liquid crystal display, as well as a red light-emitting diode display that shows a number. The liquid crystal display, or LCD, as it will be called from this point on, is the instrument's way of communicating with you by displaying function or programming information, as well as the actual name of the voice that you are using. The light-emitting diode display, or LED, as it will be called from this point on, serves the purpose of letting you know the number of the memory location being used. In order for this tutorial to be as clear and helpful as possible, your DX should be set to certain known values. At this time, then, press the brown function select switch. Look at the LCD display. The top line of the display will read function select. The bottom line will have a message that relates to the function mode. Next, Press switch 1 from the group of 32 green numbered switches to the right of the display. Sequentially, now press number 2, then 3, then 4, and so forth to switch 32, reading the message in the display after each switch. Reading the labels under each numbered switch confirms the name of the function that is available to be changed. This you only visually note on your first pass through the switches. This is also your first experience in learning that the 32 numbered switches have a minimum of three uses. Noting the two sliders at the left of the face of the DX, you see two green switches. The first switch is labeled No-1 Off, 
and a second yes plus one on. By using these or the data entry slider, which is immediately to the left of the two data entry switch, you enter changes to either the programs while programming or editing, or enter changes dealing with the functions of the instrument. You will now set your DX to certain given knowns by following this procedure. From the set of 32, to press number 1, then read in the LCD, the phrase, Master Tune Adjust. Play a note and move the data entry slider up and down and listen to the pitch of whatever sound is in the memory change. The purpose of this entry, obviously, is to match the pitch of the musical programs to some outside source. When you play with other instruments or non-tunable sound sources, you, of course, will want to adjust the pitch of the DX to match that source. Function 1 tunes the DX. Consecutively now, go through the remainder of the set of 32 functions using either the data entry slider or the on-off, yes-no, data entry switches. Making sure that the DX function 2 is set at poly, function 3 set at 0, 4 at 0, 5 at follow, 6 at off, 7 at 0, 8 at MIDI 1. 9 through 16 are not relevant and need not be checked now. 17, 21, 25, and 29 should be set at 0, and all other switches on the bottom row set at off. Perhaps you might need to rewind the tape a bit to hear that section once again. So now, turn off the tape, or rewind, and I'll wait for you to get this much done. You don't have to program a sound to play the DX. There are 32 sounds waiting for you to hear right now. Press the green memory select, internal. This allows you to choose from any of the 32 memory select switches that we have just functions to select sounds. You might make a mental note that these 32 switches are used for three totally different purposes. As was previously discussed, you are either playing programming, or setting functions while you're at the DX. While your finger always touches the green switch area to choose which will be changed, the identification of the effect that will be achieved is written over, on, or under the switch itself. Continuing now with playing, press switch number one. You have called from the internal memory the completed voice data and placed that information into a buffer. You don't actually need to know that yet, but later on, you'll be glad you do. Fully depress the volume pedal first, and adjust the output volume of the DX with the volume slider that is the farthest to the left of the set of controls. Turn your amplification system up to a comfortable level, and play. As you play, you can make note of the fact that 16 notes can be played simultaneously. Take time now to go through the 32 different sounds that are awaiting your hands. Play some music. Enjoy switching from sound to sound by merely depressing one of 32 voice selector switches. Before you turn off the tape to do this, insert a ROM cartridge into the slot at the far right of the face of the DX. It slides easily into a connect. Force it. You have now prepared the DX to have 64 sounds immediately available. To listen to the cartridge memory, press Memory Select Cartridge, just as you did to select internal memories. You can go through the 32 switches again, for now you think you have a total of 64 sounds immediately available. On the back of the cartridge is a small sliding switch that says A or B. This switch allows a single cartridge to hold 64 different sounds. Or, to restate that, two sets of 32. You can listen to cartridge set A or B by changing the position of this switch. What you really have now is a total of 96 sounds in resident memory. Turn off the tape now and enjoy some of the tonal dimensions available through Yamaha's FM digital synthesis. Play with all 96. Have a good time. You have just experienced a musical fantasy, a new dimension of precision, a voyage through a tonal spectrum far more vast than you probably had expected. 
96 great sounds instantly available at your fingertips, all made possible from the powerful ability of FM synthesis to create sounds with uncanny realism and warmth. Choose any nice sound from the internal memory as we continue, using that sound to teach you how to add the use of function switch to give you greater personal control over the sound that you are playing. Press function, read the names under the 32 green switches, and let's add portamento to the sound. Portamento is the phenomenon of sliding from pitch to pitch rather than directly stepping to the next note. Press 5 to determine the type of portamento that is available. You can choose to either have the pitches follow to replace previously played notes or be retained through 16 key depressions. Press switch 7 and choose a portamento time. Times can range from 0, which is no portamento at all, through 99, which would be the slowest time that can be allowed. Using the data entry slider, choose different values of time as you experiment with polyphonic portamento. Note that large changes in the values are most easily made with a data entry slider and small increments entered with the plus one, minus one switches next to that slider. As a part of this experience, change from poly to mono and note that you have two choices of portamento available, full time and fingered. Full time is easy to understand. Everything slides all the time, but in the mono mode, you now can play only one key at a time. Fingered portamento is understood by first playing each note detached from the next note. In comparison with that, if you play a second note while the first note is still depressed, the pitch will slide to that note. Detached goes directly to the pitch, and legato playing causes only the next note to be slid to at whatever rate you have chosen. Go to switch 6 and turn glissando on. Glissando is similar to portamento, but involves chromatic steps between your selected notes. Play with the poly and mono modes using portamento. Repeat these same experiments with glissando. Try some different sounds on the DX in these assorted modes, and I'll wait for you again. Remember, green to play and brown to change functions. You're back. Fantastic. Reset your portamento time to zero. Turn the glissando off and be sure that the DX is in the poly mode. This time, we are going to again use function to program the range of pitch change from the wheel. The round controller at the far left side of the keyboard. Using your acquired knowledge to gain this function, enter a number with the data entry switch from 1 through 12. As you play a single note on the keyboard, turn the wheel either toward or away from you to the full limit of its excursion. You note that the number 1 is equal to one half step, while the number 12 is an octave. Each unit of 1 is a half step. Hence, the number 7 would be equal to a pitch bend range of a fifth. The range of pitch bend is plus or minus whatever interval you have selected, either sharp or flat, from the self-centering wheel. While you are dealing with the wheel, try switch 4, step. You note, as you play and turn the wheel, that rather than bending the note either sharp or flat, that the pitch steps by interval of range you have set. Each unit, as before, is equal to a half step. Leaving that, let us now look at the possibilities available using the sets of choices under the green switches that are numbered from 17 through 32. In this group, there are four related types of controllers, each capable of doing the same thing, but being achieved by different devices. For now, we will discuss only switches 17 through 20, which will program the modulation wheel. Realizing that the same functions are available in groups of four for the foot controller, breath controller, and aftertouch sensors. First, we will set the range by pressing function, and then 17. Enter 99 into the display. Next, switch to 18, and turn the effect on, using the normal data entry method. Press memory select, and go through a few sounds, utilizing the effect of adding vibrato by the use of the modulation wheel. 
Having done that, turn the pitch modulation off and turn on amplitude modulation. Again, return to memory select and play. Again, seeing the effects that can be added with the wheel. Back to function and try out number 20, e.g. bias. Experiment with two at a time, then all three. Change the range to hear that the amount of effect is established by entering a larger number into range. Enter the correct information to return the modulation wheel to an all-off position. And if you have a breath controller, repeat these same experiments with this Yamaha exclusive device. As a comment, I might say that since you have a 16-voice instrument and a great opportunity to use both hands fully, it is often convenient to use your mouth as a controller rather than being forced to give up the musical use of your left hand on the keyboard. Repeat the experiments again using the foot controller and finally with pressure on the keys themselves. Try combinations of effects with the four controllers you have available. This is good news. You are halfway out of the Twilight Zone. You already have lots of sounds in your library and now you can manipulate these into memories as you choose. You can deal with all playing functions. You're half an expert. It's time for another break so you can enjoy your instrument for a while. When you return, I'll teach you how to program your own tonal creations with FM Digital Technology by Yamaha. At last, we enter the programming zone, a wondrous area to explore the sounds of the future. The joy of entering your own mind's creation into the memories of the DX, the reality of translating a figment of your imagination into the audio spectrum of today. This is FM Digital Programming. It should be safe to assume that by now you are comfortable dealing with the data entry selection of the DX. It is also safe to assume that you are used to reading the messages in the LCD display. These concepts are used consistently for programming your own sound into the memory of the synthesizer. The technique of digital programming, however, is entirely different from that of old analog instruments that use various wave shapes and filters. This old and somewhat obsolete system is generally called subtractive synthesis. For the basic method used is that of starting with a raw wave shape and eliminating that which you do not choose to hear. With FM synthesis, you are building your own wave shape in order to create exactly what you do choose to hear. Included in this process is creating the internal harmonic motion that is characteristic of natural sounds. With subtractive synthesis, it is typically only possible to shift the harmonic structure at the top or bottom of the frequency spectrum. While with FM synthesis, the animation characteristics of natural instruments is easily achieved. Before you can start manipulating the various components that are used for the creation of your own sound, it is important to understand the five basic building blocks of FM. As used by Yamaha in the DX synthesizers, these five basic areas are those of pitch, envelope generators and scaling, low frequency oscillators, operator output levels and algorithms. Each one of these will be clearly defined for you, and then we will tie that information together in order for you to be able to program the sound that only you can hear. First, let me give you a broad overview of these components. You should know that FM stands for Frequency Modulation, a concept of using one audio range sine wave to modulate, or change the harmonic structure of another sine wave. Audio range sine waves are generally in the range from 20 to 20,000 hertz, or cycles per second. You might be reminded that the A that is normally used for tuning is a rate of 440 hertz, or cycles per second. A single sine wave by itself has no overtones. The sound of a sine wave is pure. In order to create a new wave shape, which is another way of saying to create a complex tone, the ratio of pitch of one sine wave to another is of primary importance. Properly defined, this is called the frequency ratio. Internally, the DX7 has six operators and 32 algorithms. An operator is merely one sine wave together with one envelope generator. 
An envelope generator is a module or component of the system that deals with varying time factors. Over four precisely defined periods of time, there are four levels of loudness controllable by the new Yamaha envelope. The relationship of the positioning of these six sine waves and six envelope generators or operators is called the algorithm. The correct label for an operator within an algorithm is totally dependent on the position of that operator. Carriers are the source of pitch and can be heard. Modulators change the timbre of the carriers and only their effect is heard. You must remember that you cannot hear a modulator. You can only hear the results of modulation. Low frequency oscillators are utilized within this system to shift either pitch if they are applied to a carrier or shifts in timbre if they are assigned to a modulator. Low frequency oscillators are in reality the same as audio oscillators, differing only in their range. A low frequency oscillator may beat as slowly as one cycle every few seconds. The final building block for FM synthesis is the output level of each operator. These output levels control either the loudness of the pitch if they are carriers or the intensity of the modulation if they are modulators. Purely for its educational value, even modulators are dealing only with the changes in loudness. But it is because of their use that they cause the timbre to be changed. Let's review that again. Six operators with controllable intensities are positioned by the use of an algorithm to achieve a particular tone. That tone is capable of having either a vibrato or a tremolo. The duration of the sound is fully adjustable. It's getting easier. One more time. By choosing the relationships of sine waves and controllers of time, it is possible to create a complex sound that you want to hear. The technique of programming itself is rather simple. The terminology or language is the hardest part, but is needed in order to be understood. Let us now take a good look at the algorithms that are available to be used. You remember that within an algorithm, there are six operators. Looking at the diagram on the front of the DX, you see that algorithms number one, two, and three have two carriers. A carrier on the diagram is the operator at the absolute bottom of the chain. Hence, there are two sources of pitch from the first four algorithms. Number five and six show three carriers, or sources of pitch. Number seven through fifteen have two sources of pitch, and number sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen, one carrier pitch available. Look at the remainder of the algorithms, and note the position of the carriers and the modulators. What does all this mean? Any sound that you are going to choose to create will have certain specified characteristics. For example, a real trumpet can create only one pitch at a time. Harpsichords might have two or three strings or pitch playing each key. A chorus of three trumpets would require three pitches. Electric organs might have six pitches heard. The correct selection of the most appropriate algorithm, therefore, is based both on the number of pitches required for each key that is depressed, together with the complexity of the tone that is to be programmed. Algorithm number 18 probably is the best choice for a complex brass sound. The reason for this is that there is only one carrier, as would be characteristic of this type of instrument. But there are five modulators available to create an active, moving harmonic structure. Algorithm 5 or 6 would be a wise choice for harpsichords or other plucked instruments. Algorithm 32 is the right choice for electric organs or other relatively pure sounds. A good rule of thumb is to choose the algorithm that has the carriers in the right place for the number of pitches per key depressed and appropriate modulators above these carriers to reshape the pure tone of the sine waves to a complex tone of the type you are creating. Be aware of the fact that if there are no modulators over carriers, the tones from that particular carrier will remain a pure sine wave of whatever pitch you choose that is being controlled only by its envelope for duration. The diagram on the DX that is to the right of the algorithm drawings graphs the new Yamaha envelope generator. An envelope generator itself is a controller that deals with time. In the case of the DX, this envelope, as we will now call it, deals solely with loudness. 
If the envelope is controlling the loudness of a carrier, you will hear the results only as volume changes over time. If the envelope is actually dealing with the loudness of a modulator, which it really is, it will to your ears appear to control the shifting buzziness or timbre of the tone. That isn't as hard to understand as it first appears. You remember that you can hear a carrier, but you can only hear the results of a modulator as it is affecting the tone of a carrier. You hear the tonal shift. You listen to the tonal carrier. I'm being quite specific about this fact, for the truth is that modulators are being controlled by the envelope to create differences in loudness. For a bit later, I will show you a great trick to make all this programming easier by listening to a modulator, even though that's not possible. It's a programming convenience that I'm sure you will find helpful. The envelope on the DX has four specified points of volume, or to use the proper terminology, four levels. These four levels are reached by four controllable periods of time, and once again, using correct terminology, four rates. In the display, you will see that there are 100 positions available for each of four levels. There are also 100 speeds to choose from for each of four rates. The numbers in the display read from 0 to 99. With a computer, 0 is a valid number. It does not mean none. It is a period of time, a specific level, or has other meanings, but it does not necessarily mean nothing. Let's chat about envelopes, as they are meaningful to you with instruments you know. A bell, for example, when struck, is the loudest it can be. Over a period of time, the tone smoothly and consistently becomes softer until it's gone. A plucked guitar would have a similar characteristic, loudest at the moment of pluck and smoothly softer. A tuba, by contrast, does not make a sound instantly, as would a struck instrument, but takes a little time for the air that the player is blowing into the instrument to travel through the plumbing before coming out of the bell of the horn. When the player stops, blowing, there is also a short time that passes before silence is achieved. This time certainly is a great deal shorter than the time required for a bell to stop ringing. The last example might be that of an electric organ, where because of electrical key switches has the sound that is either on or off. There is no build-up of tone, there is no lingering sound when the finger is lifted from the key, on or off, that's it. Envelope generators are a critical part of the development of the sound that you are programming. A major part of the success of the reality of the sound that you create lies with careful selection of the time factors of that sound. Another quick review of the Yamaha DX envelope is a good idea. Using four rates, it is possible to achieve four specified degrees of loudness. These are both labeled in the display window in units from 0 to 99. Think of it as a trip. What four places are you going, and how fast are you going to get to each of those places? As far as the rates are concerned, the measure to you of your speed can most easily be remembered by thinking of the rates as you do of speed in an automobile. 90 miles an hour is a lot faster than 40 miles an hour. 40 miles an hour is faster than 15 miles an hour. A large number is a fast speed. A small number is a slow speed, just like a speedometer. To continue this automobile thought, there is also a specified relationship between your rate of speed and your destination. At a given rate, it takes longer to arrive at a destination that is further away than it would if the destination were close. The same facts apply to the rates and level relationships of the DX. To the right of the diagram of the envelope is a diagram that shows keyboard level scaling. For each of the six operators, it is possible to set a key on the keyboard and either increase or decrease the output level of the envelopes on each side of that defined key position. From this concept, you can imagine that a sound could become louder, softer, brighter, more mellow, or whatever you choose to have happen to the tonal characteristic. The breakpoint is selected by key position. Middle C is known as C3, one octave higher is called C4. Either a linear or exponential curve can be chosen to the right or left of this breakpoint. Consider a linear curve to be a straight line and an exponential curve to be an actual curve. 
there are 99 depths available for these increases or decreases in envelope amplitude. Fine programs will take advantage of this ability to achieve authenticity throughout the sound's range. It's your turn. This is it. You are now going to program your first sound. Let's make it some sort of plucked instrument with three pitches per key depressed. In order for this to be easy to do from scratch, the DX has a voice initialize function. Function. Remember that? It must be something brown because the word function will lead you to the brown set. Press function and then look under the 32 switches until you find item 10, voice initialize. Press this. Read in the window the message, voice initialize, question mark. Answer through the data entry, yes. The new message then is, are you sure? Again, you will answer yes. Just to let you know about this, the reason for the are you sure is that you might not have stored a sound that is whatever position you are using, and you might just be reminded in time that it would be more prudent to use some other position for programming. This time, we're sure, so go ahead and say yes. Voice initialize is a great convenience for programming from scratch, for it gives you a simple known beginning point for the creation of your sound. Operator number 1 has an output level of 99. Its pitch is 1.00. Operators 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 have output levels of 0. There is no pitch or amplitude modulation from the LFO. All six envelopes are the same with an immediate starting and stopping time. There is no keyboard rate scaling. There is no level scaling. The four envelope rates are all 99. Level 1, 2, and 3 of the envelopes are all 99, and level 4 is 0. This fourth level at 0 is going to be typical of most of your sounds, for you remember that all envelopes deal solely with loudness. If level 4 of a carrier is something other than 0, there will be sound all the time when you take your fingers off the keys. It will never stop. Carefully write this information into your human computer. One of these days soon, your DX will not stop making a sound because you will have a level 4 of a carrier at some level other than 0. You really don't want that often, do you? Since our programming project is that of making some sort of plucked instrument with three pitches per key depressed, we should first choose the algorithm that is best suited for this goal. We need three carriers or sources of pitch. Algorithm 5 is this configuration. Over switch 7 is the label Algorithm. Press 7, and with the data entry slider, achieve Algorithm 5 in the LCD display. Now that you are programming, let me comment about the data entry slider and the plus 1, minus 1 switch. If you want a large, fast change, use the slider. If you want a small increment of change, then the two switches will step the data entry by one unit. Only you know which is better for what you are doing. Let me assure you that the units of one are discernible. Programmers with limited experience usually make too large an increment of change and are never aware that they went right by the correct position because of this too great a change error. Now that you have an algorithm, you must ensure that you will be working with the right operator. Look at the LCD display. In the upper right-hand position of that window, it will say, Operator, question mark, 1 through 6. Since the algorithm is the basic system configuration for our sound, we do not have to be concerned with which operator is being changed. However, in order to continue, find Operator Select to the left of the display, and having first pressed 21, Rate, repeatedly press Operator Select until the display reads Operator 1. The next step is to decide how long this pluck sound will last. That is a function of time, so you must create a proper envelope. The envelope, as you remember, has both rates and levels which require decisions from you. Since it is a pluck sound that is being developed, rate 1 will probably be 99. Level 1 will also be 99, because one characteristic of a pluck sound is that it is both the loudest and the brightest when first played. Rate 2 is the amount of time that will be used for the decay of the sound to lesser volume level. 
Hence, level 2 must be a great deal less than level 1. Let's make it 0. The rate will be something relatively slow. Let's try 24. Level 3 should be set at 0. Once we have no sound set at level 2, we cannot for a plucked instrument suddenly have sound again. Level 4 is 0, and you know why. Play the keys. That's nice. It's a good amount of time for something that is plucked. It doesn't sound much like anything plucked, however, for right now you are hearing a single sine wave that makes a pure sound. We must add FM to this carrier from a modulator. Looking once again at the algorithm, you note that operator 2 is set to modulate operator 1. More accurately stated with this algorithm, modulator 2 will modulate carrier 1. You could enter the same envelope information to operator 2, but in order to save time, you can duplicate the operator 1 rate and level information to operate 2 with a slick trick. With your left hand, press store and read in the window the message that you are going to copy envelope 1 to operator, question mark. Well, it's 2 that we want right now. So while holding down the store switch with your left hand, with your right hand, press switch 2 and you're finished. You have an absolute copy of the envelope 1 information to envelope 2. It makes sense, however, that you don't have to do this. It very well might be that you do not want these envelopes to be the same, in which case, of course, you enter the four rates and four levels in the regular data entry manner. Play a note. No change. When a new sound is being created through the convenience of the voice initialize method, the output level of operators 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are set at zero. Only operator 1 has an output, that is 99. Change from operator 1 that you are working on to operator 2. Switch to 27, which as you read is operator output level. Let's go all the way to 99. Wow, what a change. This is the brightest this sound will be, for we have the maximum level of both the envelope and the overall output of the modulator. Spend some time now changing the operator 2 output level and learn about the varying degrees of brightness caused by changing the amount of modulation being used. Next, switch back to the first operator and apply keyboard rate scaling so that there will be a more normal and traditional set of time factors over the range of the keyboard. The lowest notes should last longer than the highest notes. Let your ears be your guide. There is no absolutely right and wrong to any of this process. What you choose to hear is right. If you don't like what you hear, change it. Right now, you are the ultimate authority on tone. This is going to be your first sound. As soon as you are satisfied with this third of the pluck sound that is being created, it simplifies the completion of the sound if you turn off what you have completed. Switches 1 through 6 make this simple. So far in the display, you have looked at six ones. By pressing green switches, one and two, you will see that the display reads zero, zero, one, 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 one. This means that operators one and two are turned off. If you play a key now, however, you still have no sound, even though operators three through six are on, because we have reached this point through voice initialization. Switch to operator 3 and make the output level 99. This time, though, it will be interesting to have the pitch of the second carrier, which in reality is operator 3, be an octave higher than that of carrier 1. Press frequency course, and with the data entry, go to 2.00. That's up the octave, as you can hear. Now, just as you did before, manufacture a reasonable envelope for this higher pluck sound. Perhaps a somewhat shorter time would make sense because of an acoustic phenomenon of reduced time periods for higher pitched sounds. You remember from our earlier discussion of envelopes that faster times are most easily remembered by the automobile speedometer method. If our first set of envelopes was at a speed, or more properly, rate of 24, we now want this one to be faster, and we will choose a higher number. How about 36? For the same reasons as before, let's copy this envelope to operator 4, and then by using operator select, make this output 99. Do something to the rate scaling. Choose an output level different from 99 that sounds good. Play. 
How's that? In order for you to hear all of what you have accomplished, turn operators one and two back on. You did it. That's two-thirds of your first sound. Think of this as a little quiz. I'm not going to tell you how to handle the last two operators. You know that concept. Do it yourself. After you finish, celebrate. That's your sound. It's so good that you can save it. In order to do this, remove the memory protect. See that there are two green memory protect switches. Since we are working with internal memories, press that switch and the data entry. Take off the memory protect. Having done that, Press Store, and while holding it down, press the memory location where your new creation will live. Just for the sake of your education, let's return to the sound you created and edit it. In spite of the fact that it's a good sound, we'll make a few changes. Time we are not entering the programming division of the DX through the voice initialize method, so all of the things that you did to create this voice will remain the same. Press the Violet Edit slash Compare switch, as you did when you were checking out the pre-programmed voices in your DX. And let's do something a bit creative. The first change that we will make will be to name your sound. Switch number 32 allows you to do this. Look carefully at the switches on the DX. You see that there is either a black letter or a number printed on each. These are the sources for naming your sounds. Holding down the character switch with your left hand, it's under the Edit Compare label, press the appropriate switches with numbers or letters. Perhaps your own name would be the best choice for your first sound. Well, that's nice. Let's try adding vibrato to your sound now. Look over the top of the set of switches from 9 through 16, for this is the section that deals with low-frequency oscillators. First, you need to choose a sensitivity to pitch modulation. Switch 15 does this. There are several degrees of sensitivity available, and you must choose one for there to be the ability for the LFO pitch modulation section to function. By now, as you expect, larger numbers give you a greater range than do smaller numbers. Having done that, switch to number 12 and enter the pitch modulation depth. Next, go to speed, which is number 10, and choose a rate that you believe is musical. It probably will be in the 30-something range. Keep playing and checking until it sounds right to you. Remember, your ears are the only ones that count right now. Feedback is located at switch 8. Note that in every algorithm, there is one operator with a little bracket around it. This means that it's capable of frequency modulating itself to produce a more complex sound. With algorithm 5, the one that is being used for the plucked something that you created, the feedback loop, is on operator 6. There are seven levels of feedback modulation available. Try them out on this sound. If feedback is excessive, the sound distorts and becomes similar to pure noise. This you want at times, other times you don't. But again, it's your ears that will be the final determination of what is right and what is wrong. How would your creation be if it were an octave lower? While you are still in the edit mode, press switch 31 and note that the display window tells you that middle C equals C3. The bottom note of your keyboard is called C1. You can figure out the rest. The one and only entry to the computer that does not use data entry is this function. To transpose your sound to either another octave or to let middle C equal some other note, after pressing key transpose, Play the one key that you want middle C to equal. If, for example, you were to press the G above middle C, your entire sound would self-transpose up a fifth. Remember this trick someday when someone asks you to play something in a different key than you find comfortable. You can play the tune where it is easy for you and let the DX do the work. Store your changed sound. You know how. Go back a few more times and edit your sound. Add amplitude modulation. Experiment. Learn by doing. Let's talk about the pitches of the operators for a while. Voice initialize again. Choose algorithm 1, and having made the same preliminary steps as we did before to ensure that you are dealing with operator 1, switch to number 18, frequency course. 
Through the use of the data entry slider, you both see and hear that you have an entire overtone series available from the fundamental to the 31st harmonic. By switching at the 31st harmonic to frequency find, you can hear even higher pitches. Frequency ratios are the basis of FM programming. If, for example, you were to program operator 1 and 2 at the same pitch, it would be called a one-to-one -one relationship. If you were to look at this relationship on a scope, it would appear to be a sawtooth wave. A two-to-one relationship creates a square wave. A one-to-two relationship produces a pulse. The degree of modulation that you apply will determine the harmonic content of these basic wave shapes. While using this newly voice initialized sound, experiment with a pitch envelope. Rates of this division work the same as do the rates of normal envelopes, but this particular section deals with moving pitches. Levels here, however, are the levels of the pitch. The number 50 for a level is a concert pitch, the normal pitch that you expect for your creation. Higher or lower numbers are deviations in pitch that follow the rates that have been previously established. Think about this pitch envelope for a moment, for it too adds a great deal to the realism of the sound that you want to hear. Traditional instruments often have problems with pitch. It is quite typical that their initial sound is slightly flat or sharp, but the player either adjusts very quickly or the instrument itself moves into tune. A string that is stretched to be plucked is not absolutely in tune, for it will be just a tiny bit sharp, but will then go into tune. Think about other problems of acoustic instruments or your fanciful creations. In addition to programming what is right about them, include what is wrong. The final result adds to the realism of your programming. A while ago, I promised to tell you a good trick so that you can hear a modulator, but we both know that's impossible. You can only hear a carrier. You hear the results of a modulator. Let's go back to the new sound and do a miracle. You know how to enter the edit mode, so do that. Now go to Algorithm Select and switch from Algorithm 5 to Algorithm 32. You are hearing all six carriers. Turn off the operators individually, as you know how, and listen to each independently. Change the time factors of one of these three modulators. In algorithm 5, the modulators were operators 2, 4, and 6. With the different time facets that you now can hear, it might be easier to listen to an audio source rather than a result from the modulation. When what is to be the modulator is changed, return to the algorithm that is required to produce the sound and check your results. This technique will probably save a lot of time, and I believe you'll find to be a great convenience for programming, either from scratch or making a creative edit to one of the sounds that was supplied with your DX. Do some more different programs of your own. Experiment with slight detunings between carriers for a chorus effect. See what happens with different ratios of the modulators to the carriers. Spend a lot of time checking out the good sounds that were pre-programmed for you. It really helps. Part of the good news is that there is absolutely nothing you can do while programming that will harm your DX. You may make some strange sounds, but you can't do anything wrong. Let's assume that you have some new sounds that you want to keep, or perhaps from the sounds that were supplied with the DX, there are particular sounds from different sets that would be handy for you to have on a new cartridge for immediate loading of that group. You already have a cartridge in your DX. Carefully now, press Memory Select, Internal, and then switch 1. You read the name of the sound in the LCD. Now press Memory Select Cartridge. Again, press 1. There is another name in the display now, for a different memory source has been chosen. At this time, press Memory Select Internal again, but do not press anything else. Read in the window that the name of the sound on the second line has not changed, but the top line tells you that you are in internal memory. The lower line begins with the letters CRT, meaning that while you are in internal memories, the sound was from the cartridge source. If you want to move the sound from the cartridge to the internal memory, Press Store and the location where you choose to have the tone reside. 
the reverse is true to go from internal to cartridge memory. With this system, you can arrange your sounds as will be most convenient for you using the EEPROM. An EEPROM, for your information, is an electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. That only means that you can change it. ROMs, read-only memories, are not user-changeable. One last item for you about the DX. There are three jacks on the back that relate to the MIDI interface system. This stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface and is a system by which you can play more than one synthesizer at a time by having this connection completed. The output, called out, will be the keyboard that is sending information to the other instrument that is connected to in. All keyboard information together with pitch bending and modulation information is being transmitted through this connector. When you change sounds on the master synthesizer, the slave will change to that same sound number. The number of manufacturers of synthesizers now have adapted this system. The opportunities for this new type of interfacing are great, and as time goes by, there will be a great deal of interesting software using these connectors. You're in control. There is no limit to your imagination. Use it. Create your wildest dreams. Be inventive. Enjoy your DX. Enjoy music.